clearer or is easier than before. Those clarity have not been mentioned uh, to the public. Now, Professor Jongachi, what we have the IMF telling us that we shouldn't be going constantly to the central bank and exposing it for those uh, type of support, um, what really um, do we mean, Professor Lord Mentor? Yeah, of course. Um, you see, with the central bank, it has its own mandate. The central bank is supposed to ensure that there is a financial stability. Now, there's been a research that has been done over the years which indicate the central bank independence and then inflation. The reason why this research was done is that if the central bank is not independent and it has a strong executive influence, there will be a tendency that they can easily provide funds unnecessarily to the executive, and at the end of the day, it will cause inflation. Mm. Now, we look at the channels through which liquidity can, can be provided for every economy that is struggling. Liquidity is not supposed to be provided to a government that is already in distress. That is why for every IMF program we find ourselves in, uh, the first thing IMF will touch on is central bank financing. Central bank financing in a sense that the last time they came in, they said, we should do as much as we can that uh, we shouldn't exceed 5% of expected revenue for a particular year, which the, the, the government will request for um, a support from the, um, the, the central bank. Effectively, the central bank has a role to play in ensuring that government smoothens its revenue fluctuations because they know there are seasonal you know, fluctuations in government revenue through taxes and other things. So the central bank comes in with the support. So usually, the central bank lends to the government, but not for long term. They are basically for short term. So they don't extend beyond one year. In the end, if you look at what we have in Ghana, it's a complete ball game altogether. If you look at the central bank's uh, uh, exposure as far as um, government debt is and you can look at the 2021 you know that um, 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 that report mm. from the uh, Ministry of Finance and clearly um, it tells you that the central bank is also exposed both the central bank and then the individual banks are exposed to the tune of about 50 percent of the government entire debt and if you take the central bank's one alone that is about, um, I don't know if my memories will serve me right. We're looking at less yeah, than 20 uh, um, billion, 20 million um, Ghana cities. So, um, if you relate that and you deduct, let's say, treasury bill about, you know, um, 3 billion, um, clearly it tells you that our central bank has been financing government in the long term for long term investment. And the question is, what kind of interest rate is the central bank charging? If we should go into details, we may have to know whether the central bank is charging government at the prime rate or possibly what we call the, the, the Ghana reference rate or possibly the monetary policy rate as a part of what the lending interest rate charges. So if you look at it carefully, it tells you that government has been in business through the central bank. And that compromises the independence of the, you know, the central bank. Because, you know, for a central bank, if we are measuring its independence, we look at how the governor is appointed. Already that has been compromised in our side because the constitution allows the executive to appoint the governor. So the influence is there for the governor to compromise in a way. The other thing that we were living on, which I think, with this, you know, lending to the government, in that, in that essence, we have compromised is operational independence. Over the years, with some governors and governors come in and out, they've been able to manage the operational independence. But the rate at which the current administration is borrowing from the 
you know, the, the central bank, uh, it has compromised that independence, that operational independence that the uh, central bank the, has. And the, that is serious. It yeah. is serious because it can cause, you know, unnecessary inflation. It can even freeze up liquidity mm. because, you know, instead of the central bank to lend money to the banks, for the banks to have, you know, access to the efficient sectors of the economy to lend to, they, ra they would rather prefer channeling it to the central bank. bank yeah. And we know government history of, you know, mismanagement and all those. So effectively, now that things are not doing well, it is expected that the central bank will channel the... Uh, Professor Lord you know, Benson. Hello, can you hear me, please? Yes. To the, to the point that now the IMF says that there has to be a pact or some level of uh, agreement between government uh, and then the central bank, compelling it not to go to the other... Um, it also means that that's a condition precedent for us getting a board level agreement. Well, well so, 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 so we come back to the studio. Within government circles, Kofi, is it an issue, um, particularly when the IMF, it's, okay. Professor Lord Mens, are you back? Yes, can you hear me, please? Okay, so my question was to the point that the IMF now says that there needs to be an agreement between the two, government on one hand and then the central bank. It also means that it puts governments in a very difficult situation, but also a, con a condition precedent for us to get uh, that needed board level uh, approval, so to speak. Well, um, you see, it's part of the fiscal discipline. I mean, mm. not to borrow from your central bank. Central bank is not supposed to be subfinancing government activities. Government must be in business. Government should be able to raise money, use the money for the intended purposes, make returns out of it, and pay back the money. Yeah. So effectively, if you want to rely on your central bank, then if you don't even have to go and borrow from outside anywhere. The central bank should print money every now and then for us to you know, manage the economy with. Okay. There's a reason why... There has always been a cap on the quantum of monies that government can borrow from their central banks. All right. And once you compromise it, the government and the central bank's credibility goes down. And anybody that is lending to a country that has been borrowing from its central bank indirectly, it tells you that a country has been printing its own money. So it won't you know, be a good signal out there for people to get to know that you know, we've been borrowing, we've been borrowing from our own central bank. Okay. And so it is going to be one of the main requirements for the current, you know, um, what do you call it, board approval that we are looking out for. All right. And it's a way to tell you that you have to stay financially disciplined. Well, 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 j j just hold it there. Now, Kofi, it also means that government had been in a position. You, you particularly would um, hear Joe Jackson, a number of the finance professors uh, prior to today, saying that that, was the phenomenon that was ongoing or being undertaken by government or the finance ministry. Uh, within the circles of government, is it a concern now that, well, at the rate at which we're borrowing from the central bank, we could ultimately or have already compromised the commercial banks that we have or the banking sector generally? All right. Good, good morning to you, Roland. And, uh, well, good morning, Kofi. Good morning to my brother, Aduji, and then Professor Mensah. Mm. Uh, he's made some very... Uh, cogent points uh, in as far as uh, uh, borrowing from central bank and how it relates to inflation and all of that. It's, it's true because the more they print money, it spikes up inflation. So that's, that's a very good point. But there's a history to all of this. You know, if you go back to as far back as 2014, uh, under President Mahama, there was an agreement between the government it could even be before, but my research shows that uh, as recent as 2014, there was an agreement that every year the central government or the government will borrow up to 5% from the central government or the central bank or Bank of Ghana every year. So this was happening, and then when this government came in, we signed a memorandum of an understanding, and I have it here. Uh, December 29th, 2017. And then um, the MOU sought to stop borrowing money from Central Bank. And that was um, an MOU signed for what we call 
zero financing agreement. So that whole thing stopped from 2017 all the way to 2020. Then uh, Bank, Bank of uh, the Central Government triggered Section 30 of the Bank of Ghana Act mm -hmm. to seek for emergency financing. So if you recall, at a point, Bank of Ghana gave government about 10 billion Ghana cities. That was triggered because of the COVID and the emergency support that we needed. So there is a history to this where it was at some point a consistent thing that was happening, which stopped and then later on triggered because of COVID and all the financial turmoil that we went through. Now, government since triggering that act, Section 30, has also begun processes to stop borrowing money from the central bank. But obviously, it's not an easy process. So government has always intended to stop that process. But it is an ongoing process that it aims to achieve. So IMF saying this is not something that government necessarily disagrees. Because it's something that the government from the beginning, as far back as uh, December 29, 2017, is something the government believed in, that it is not a good thing to always borrow money from the central bank. And that's why it stopped doing it in 2017. And unfortunately, we had to go back, go back to it because of COVID and all of that. So certainly, I think it's something government is committed to, to ensure that we, we slow down the uh, support that we seek from the central bank to ensure that we don't incur some of the challenges that Professor Lord Mensah was referring to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the history to the whole thing. Yeah, but uh, Edigi, the critical thing is the commitment. And I remember Isaac Adongo, who had been speaking keenly on the subject back in 2019, uh, had raised concerns about uh, how the government, even though it had a pact with the central bank, kept going to the Bank of Ghana for some level of uh, support as well. And, and how that, based on its own terms, was reneging on that. If you look at how now the banks have been exposed and the current state of, uh, of our debt-to-GDP ratio, how do we put all that into perspective? Okay, so um, Roland, so good morning and uh, good morning to your viewers. Um, I need to do this quickly, congratulate um, the regional youth organizer, duly elected in Central Region, a colleague lawyer, um, Nayan, who won, uh, Naya, who won an election just uh, a few days ago. I wish to congratulate him and pray that he delivers Central Region for, for us in 2024. That said, you see, um, we find ourselves in a situation where, like my friend, uh, my brother pointed out, if you recall, by 2016, the NDC, even though we had an election, a very crucial election, we decided to do zero financing from the Bank of Ghana. And so the record will show that even though we had a, a crucial election in 2016, President John Dramani Muhammad, you know, took a very intentional decision not to borrow from the Bank of Ghana. And it was done for a purpose. Because you see, borrowing from the Bank of Ghana has a tendency of turning you, quote unquote, into a drug addict. Because you know that it is quite easier to just place a call to the governor, to the board of Bank of Ghana, and within two minutes, the money that you need will be given to you. Unlike the other kinds of borrowings that requires parliamentary approval and others, so it's always easier going through the Bank of Ghana route. But the challenge with the Bank of Ghana route, as the professor of finance pointed out, one, it does the crowding out of private businesses. Because ordinarily, monies that the traditional banks are supposed to advance, right, to businessmen to do their businesses, to grow the economy. Because government feels that, oh, you know what, let's just go. BOG will just float some bonds. And the banks knowing this traditional knowing, uh, notion that it is difficult for government to default, BOG is most likely. So if you look, in the year 2020, the year COVID struck, government of Ghana borrowed in excess of 10 billion Ghana cities from Bank of Ghana. And this pattern had continued. 
So by the year ending 2021, the Akufuado Baumia administration had done 35 billion Ghana cities borrowing from Bank of Ghana alone. Then in November, when the budget statement was read, if you recall, just by February, the various rating agencies have downgraded this country. So our access to euro bond became problematic. So immediately starting from the time where we had challenges going into the euro bond market, again, Akufado plays his call to the Bank of Ghana through his cousin, the finance minister. And by December 2022, we were doing in excess of 100 billion Ghana cities borrowing from Bank of Ghana. That's ridiculous. So we have a situation where we have done in excess of 100 billion Ghana cities borrowing from the Bank of Ghana. It has never happened, unprecedented. Mm. And that is why today, the IMF World Bank and our international creditors are beginning to be worried that this symbiotic, incestual relationship between government and Bank of Ghana has compromised the finances of the republic. Look, you see, and I have always maintained that the signs were on the wall. What were the signs? The kind of policy mix by Ken Oforiata was borrowing borrowing, borrowing, unbridled. To the extent that by 2017, immediately he became finance minister, he went for the 2.25 billion from Franklin Templeton. By 2018, he had to go and do another $2 billion from the euro bond market. 2019, he did another 2 billion. 2020, he did almost get into $3 billion. As we speak, in the space of six years, right? Eurobond alone, contracted by Ken Oforiata, Baumia, and Akufuado administration, is $11 billion. I'm said, Luigi, the argument that, no, hold th on. that is always made by government is that if not for COVID and, and for the difficulties that we're facing trying to repay some of those bonds that were floated at commercial interest, we wouldn't have been in, in the difficulty. That's not true. No. The, and then, the and African and then, Development and, and, Bank latest I know, I, report. I, 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 please, no, please, no. let yeah. me just yes, clarify but, 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 but also, the, mm. there's a Bank of Ghana response to some of these um, concerns that have been raised, especially by Isaac Adongo and then the minority side, on the rate at which government was borrowing from the central bank, in which the Bank of Ghana issued a release um, just uh, in November in response to it. And they said uh, the allegation that indeed within that period $70 billion had been borrowed from the central bank were not true, but well atomized the reasons why government may have engaged the Bank of Ghana on some of those. So when we're making some of those holistic arguments, we have to put them into perspective. No, is that not true? No, no, it is not. You see, and that is why I've always said mm -hmm. that the worst governor we've had is Governor Addison. Based, now, on, based on what criteria? The criteria is simple. In the superior wisdom of the framers of the 1992 Constitution, they wanted oversight responsibility over our monetary policy to be independent. And so, right from the word go, mm. the independence of the central bank was guaranteed by the 1992 Constitution. Yes. And we have subsequently passed different, different legislation to firm up this independence of the Bank of Ghana with a view that the Bank of Ghana will set a certain monetary oversight just as to ensure stability within the economy. Regrettably, the leadership of Governor Addison has been the opposite. He's allowed Ken Oforiata the opportunity to run route like a bull in a china shop where well, today, the, the scorecard of these two managing our economy is a complete downgrade of the economy, complete destruction of livelihood, complete destruction of both the banking sector. Look, these are people who justify, for instance, the banking sector cleanup on the basis that bank managers were not running the economy well. The shareholders. Sh shareholders. And I directors. mean, bank, exactly. Based on the boldest report. Exactly. Um, among other things, mm -hmm. the asset quality mm -hmm. report mm -hmm. and the rest. Mm -hmm. But today, after a so-called banking sector cleanup, 
the health of our banks today is terrible than the time when we claim we are cleaning up the banks. Today, we are effectively imposing on banks what they call a debt restructuring program. That has never happened. And this one, it is not the fault of bank managers and shareholders. It is this Yamis twins, Ken Oforiata, Governor Addison, who had brought the economy to where what we find is? itself. Siamese. I mean, the terrible thing that we see in this economy, and if you should ask the professors who are not politicians, would need no less than 15, 20 years to bring this economy back to normalcy. Hmm. How did we get here? Roland, what justification do you have for this? Yeah. Okay. Please, Robert. Let me make a few. Let, let me yeah, make a, I wanted to go to Professor. Yeah, let me make a few. Not mentioned there. First of all, mm -hmm. it is not true mm. that President Muhammad didn't take any money. If you look I at it, I said in 2016, he did yes. zero BOG financing. It's not true. I've already, I've, I have the memorandum of, of understanding. What is not true? Oh, please, let me talk. Eduji, you just sat here and spoke. No, but okay. I'm saying, what is not let, true? I'm telling you it's not true. Okay. So, because so, if you so, look, so you're saying because a, a, an MOU, because, so you're saying because an MOU was signed in 2017. No. Is the, that, the assumption <laughs> is that in 2016 there was, I'm, was I'm, I'm, Let me, okay. can you allow me to speak, Eduji? Well, please. He's peddled a lot of No, no, I'm allowing you to speak. Please leave him and then speak. So the point is that, if you look at our debt profile, mm -hmm. you see that the one of the highest years or the years that we borrowed the most mm -hmm. was 2016. You should check. You should check. So don't come and sit here and talk about uh, President Mahama being magnanimous and he our didn't want. If you look at our debt profile both, in 2016, both domestic and yeah, external. Yeah, check. Okay. You see that 2016 was one of the highest. Now he talks about government borrowing 100 billion from central bank. Now, let's do this. If you look at the report that's come out, mm. the report says that our total debt stock mm. is 575 billion. Mm -hmm. Out of it... As at when, please? As, as at the Bank of Ghana's report of November 2022. Yes, so what are you please, talking I'm, about? I'm talking so, about yes. what, are, what are you saying? Please. It's well, November 2022, 575 billion. Out of that 575 billion, 382 is external leaving about 195 internal. Out of that 195, 170 is treasury bills and bonds. So how do you attribute 100 billion? Where are you getting the 100 billion from? Because the total debt stock domestically is 192. So where are you getting the 100 billion from? If we take out treasury bills, if we, we take out bonds to the finance houses and all of that, where are you getting that money from? It can't be true. So let's, uh, uh, let's, oh, please, no, let me finish. So I even alluded to the fact that, yes, government, when we came in, stopped taking support from Central Bank until we triggered Section 30 of the Bank of Ghana Act to take the 10 billion. So where from all these other numbers that you are throwing around without any evidence? It's, 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 it's not true. Okay. Professor Lord Mensah, it's good that you're back. Uh, can you hear me now? Hold on. Uh, yeah, I flipped a bit. I can hear you loud and clear. Now, um, the Bank of Ghana in its explanatory statements, indeed, to the market, always says that, um, of course, these government overdrafts are, are just short-term financing. But for us at November, the Bank of Ghana is still in a state of denial. But now having the realization or it now being public that the exposures based on what they were always giving government were to the point where now the commercial banks or the banking sector has been compromised or exposed than before, um, could be attributed to a situation where the Bank of Ghana has been in a state of denial and perhaps uh, not, not telling what the real issues are, how it relates on, or, or tends to relate with government or the finance ministry. Is that not the position currently as we have it? Yes, it looks like it. Um, you see, if you take uh, the 2021, I mean, uh, debt report, I always yes. make reference to the 2021 annual debt report mm. from the Bank of God. Clearly, uh, from the Minister of Finance, clearly, if you look at what uh, the debt uh, that the government owes the Bank of Ghana, mm. we're looking at it above, you know, 20 billion. But then if you... Go down the report, you will see 
the treasury bill component of it. Yeah. That is less than about, I think, $5 billion or so at a time. So if you take, you put that together and you deduct it from the entire debt, you realize that there is that kind of extension of debt into a long term instead of the short term. Yes. So effectively, it doesn't reflect the information we've been getting from the regulator. And so it tells you that the regulator has been helping. Now, if Bank of Ghana is not financing long term, then how come just, uh, from last year, February, that were downgraded, that we did not have access to the international market, that we can, we can borrow for a long term and then possibly use part of it to offset you know, existing debt, Mm. And then if you take, you know, um, the local I mean, environment where government is able to raise quite substantial amount of money in bonds, which has been locked anyway, as we speak now because of the debt restructuring, you ask yourself, you know, how government was able to finance the budget deficit that existed. And that is where I think Bank of Ghana got exposed. And I, in my earlier submission, I made a statement that if you put the debt composition of both, you know, uh, in the domestic, you know, sector, mm. you take, you know, Bank of Ghana and the banking sector, it costs more than 50% of the existing debt from that 2021 report. The 2022 is not ready. We can't make reference to it. And so I can tell you that the Bank of Ghana itself is exposed as far as this, you know, debt restructuring is concerned. And I'm wondering the kind of conditions, you know, the government will um proposed to the bank of ghana as a debt restructuring as it is doing to pensions domestic um individual bonds and institutions so uh my question has always been like okay fine is bank of ghana going to call for a negotiation with the government as to how gov a payment plan as to how government is going to pay the kind of you know debt right. that it owes the government so professor, effectively professor Mensa. Yes. The, by, by November last year, Isaac Adongo had been raising keen issues. And of course, um, I remember Joe Jackson of Dalex Finance, who speaks extensively, as well as other finance professors, uh, in, including Buck Ping, had been raising issues about the exposures of the Bank of Ghana and how it relates to the commercial bank in its entirety because um, the Ministry of Finance was always not um, being realistic how it was financing um, the deficit. Now, if you look at a situation or a practical scenario where you're not able to go into a market to get um, what you call your bonds for financing your deficit, and then now the Bank of Ghana says the situation is not pegged at 70 billion or even 100 billion, but rather in excess of uh, 40 billion, um, it, 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 does that mean that the, the bank has perhaps some questions to answer about why it's able to develop that sort of relationship and then break its own act by, is it, is it, by constantly, that, that by constantly financing an, over, an overdraft or a deficit that it's not supposed to. Roland, that relationship has already been compromised long, long ago. We in the academia have been questioning the independence of, you know, the bank. The central bank. The central bank. And um, we always ask questions, even if we get opportunity, we should change, you know, the constitution, which allowed the executive to appoint the governor of the central bank. And to some extent, the representative of the government on the board. I mean, it compromises that independence we are looking out for. And in fact, any country that the central bank is not independent, you, ca you find it difficult to control inflation. Mm. And these are some of the reasons why, you know, um, we, we, maybe we find our inflation going up, apart from the importation of inflation that we've been talking about every now and then. Now you look at the, our country, what, what is happening here. The central bank governor is appointed by the executive, which, of course, brings about, brings about the relationship that we're looking out for. And then if you, it comes to operations, we used to have some confidence in the operations of the um, of the central bank, which that, that which brings about certain levels of independence. But with the current situation and the financing that the government has been getting from the central bank, 
I can tell you that that independence has been compromised. Okay. And that is what we are worried about. Okay. All right. Uh, Able to have certain levels of, I mean, um, independence, which at the end of the day, um, some trust will be built in the financial system. Mm. As we speak now, uh, what is happening is that um, the central bank has compromised in the way, and therefore um, they have, you know, a few questions to answer, as always. All right. Uh, Kofi, it does. Let me let, respond to let, Prof. Mm. Um, I, I disagree with Prof when it comes to control of inflation vis a vis the appointment of uh, the governor of uh, Central Bank. Because we have evidence where we've been able to bring inflation to single digits. <laughs> we have evidence. I mean, it's, it's you know, so we've have, so I, I'm saying that it can't be a direct correlation necessarily. That is not to dismiss everything he said as far as independence and the appointment. Mm. There are definitely merits in what he's saying. I'm only adding that I think the direct correlation between the governor being appointed and how it affects inflation may not necessarily be that straight because there are instances, even under NDC and under MPP, where we've gone to di uh, uh, single digit inflation rate. So I, uh, that's the All comment right. I wanted to make. But yeah. it clearly means that we've been badly exposed than we thought. And the Bank of Ghana has some key questions to answer. But the responsibility is also with the finance ministry or the finance minister. You have a certain responsibility to keep your fiscal expenditure in check. And he, he clearly seemed to have just gone overboard and not told what the real issues are. And that's why now the ratios are in excess of over 540 billion, if, if, I, if I'm 575 right. billion, that's oh. the total debt stock. Please. Yeah. That's November mm. 2022. It, it, it could be more even. It's, it, it's actually going to be less, but I'll speak to it when the new numbers come out. You, when I'll no speak problem. to it. Yeah. You see, like you pointed out, yeah. sloganeering is never used to run a government. You know, these governments went to parliament and passed the Fiscal Responsibility Act and committed itself to 5%, yes. okay, Deficits, whatever. Budget deficit. Annually. Yeah. <clears throat> now, if you recall, even though the law was passed in 2018, by 2019, we're doing in excess of that 5%. By 2020, as they claim, because of COVID-19, they did 15%, the highest within the whole West African sub-region. And we have said that the only reason why we did 15% deficit in 2020 was because of the reckless election expenditure. Thankfully, the Auditor General report provide a certain perspective on how we expended COVID-19 money, totaling almost 33 billion. But you see, there was an issue I raised about how much was given by way of overdraft from government, uh, from BOG to government of Ghana. My brother challenges it. What he is not telling you is that BOG does not just give money to government of Ghana. They actually go to the treasury bills market, take T-bills, and then use that money on lend to government of Ghana by way of overdraft. So if you owe by way of treasury bills, you have to take how much of it were taken by BOG and given to government of Ghana. So you notice that in 2020, when government of Ghana borrowed the 10 billion from Bank of Ghana, that 10 billion was actually bonds that were floated by BOG. Yeah. And it becomes debt to BOG technically. Called but the, the point it's is, the oh, asset purchase program. <laughs> it's called the asset stop purchase it. program. But it's you understand from what you are saying. So basically, if yeah. you look at the treasury bills component yeah. of our total debt, yeah. you will notice that all of this includes monies that today have become over to government. Really. Another instrument. Thank, thank you. But you see, back to the questions you've raised, right from the beginning, you know, when we realized that where government was going with these borrowing programs, with a lot of the monies they were spending, we kept warning government of Ghana that, look, there is no way we are going to get to a point where our debts will be sustainable. And so from $122 billion mm. by December 2016, 
we have moved it to 574 billion by November 2022. Meaning that within this space, we've added in excess of 400 billion within six years to our public debt. What you should also know, if you read the 2022, uh, 2023 budget, the summary, the provisional summary, you notice that the depreciation of the city alone at a point added almost 98 billion to the public debt. So again, the irresponsibility of government economic management team in stabilizing the city is also further accounting for the ballooning of the public debt. And look, like I always say, what do you expect government communicators and possibly the current managers of the economy to do is to demonstrate a certain level of humility where you concede that your recklessness is what has brought the economy on its knees. Look, I, 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 I recall a famous um, um, twist, uh, I think Facebook post by Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. You recall his banter with uh, Amy Sata, where he used to say, I've given him 170 questions or whatever, he should answer it. And, and, and that would be in 2016, you mean? Yes, in 2016. I'm proud to this. And Dr. Baumia had something that he used to say on the, on the management. I'm just trying to retrieve that particular post. And uh, it's instructive that I read the things. Uh -huh. This is what Dr. Baumia said. And this was 5th December 2016. The vice president cannot answer, cannot answer because there is no defense for the reckless borrowing which has characterized the NDC government. Those were the words of Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. He took offense that the NDC administration was engaged in reckless borrowing. Today, under your watch, as the chair of the economic mismanagement team, you have moved our public debt from 122 billion by December 2016 to where we have, where now we are talking about 574. 75. And I'm uh, 75, sorry. And I'm from the way things are going, we're even going to have it going up more because uh, uh, government is determined to even borrow more. Because you see, the revenues are not doing so well. The tax government, handles. Yes, the tax handles are not doing so well. Because even in 2022, government had projected that they were going to get about 3.6 billion from e levy as part of all their permutations. e levy today had not yielded in excess of a billion Ghana cities, contrary to the 3.6 billion projection. Even more important is the fact that as, as, as we speak today, by September 2022, right, total government revenue plus um, what you call uh, grants was 60, uh, 65 billion Ghana cities. Meanwhile, we had already done expenditure in excess of 105 billion. So when you put all these numbers together, clearly, we are in a dish. We are in a deep hole. And this deep hole that we find ourselves in, we cannot come out when we are not being honest with the realities that took us there. Uh, can I make a mm. Let me go to Professor Lord Mensah. Okay. Professor Lord Mensah, I, 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 <clears throat> I just want to have two questions for you before I let you go. But just one, and then I'll come to the studio, and then you, you stay on before we go for the break. Um, okay. If you look at where we are currently, the debt spiking or spiraling out of control in excess of 570 billion. And what um, you, the finance and economic analyst, had been saying that we needed to restructure what the reality is of our external and then the domestic debt is. And then the under reporting that had been done to parliament or to the public by the finance ministry. Did we dig our own hole? And did we decide to put ourselves in this position based on how we conducted ourselves by the way of the expenditure pattern? Very good question, Roland. I think we dug our own hole and we found ourselves in it. And one interesting thing about economics is that when you are up there, you don't notice it until you find yourself in the hole. And it takes a very short time to get into the hole, but how to come out of the hole uh, would take a long time, and it takes discipline. You see, 
our problem started when we started reading budgets and a deficit of about, you know, 11 percent. Mm. Budget deficit of about 11 percent to GDP. Around 2019. Mm. We were doing very well when you, we were reading budget and you could see the deficit converging the 5 percent mark. Mm -hmm. This was around 2016, 2017. But then we thought being in the hands of IMF was a bad thing. And to some extent, exiting the IMF program, we celebrated because we we're going to get the opportunity to spend and control our finances without, you know, those restrictions. And so we came out of IMF. Of course, it was a program of three years and definitely we had to come out. And before coming out, we set up the Fiscal Responsibility Act. And then we had Fiscal Responsibility as a committee or some a board, which is supposed to... But then immediately we exited. The first budget we read, the deficit jumped from that 6 point something percent to 11 percent. And I was asking myself, I mean, how are we going to finance this? Are we changing the trajectory that has been helping us to keep our exchange rate stable? The trajectory that has been helping us to keep treasury bills to a point where the one, one, 91 day treasury bill was getting to 10%. Are we going to change the trajectory? Yes, we did. And effectively, from there on, 2020, we read a budget. And we're talking about a deficit of about 13%. And then COVID came in somewhere. Yeah, that, that 2020, we did about 15%. That was when we had a COVID. And remember, before the COVID, we were making noise of... Well, we seem to be having some disrupt. Okay. Serious epochs of... electioneering over spending mm. this making noise about it every now and then thinking that with the COVID, government is going to cut its quote according to its own size but that did not happen we spend beyond what we're supposed to spend provided freebies and in economics we should understand that there's no free lunch anywhere whatever you consume today and that is free you are deferring it to be paid in the future and that is when we started having all these problems. So the trajectory was good. If we were to keep the momentum that, you know, we find ourselves in IMF, you know, um, we were going, it could have ended us better. But we didn't. So now we have to work towards getting back to that momentum. So if you look at the budget that was read for 2023, clearly the finance minister has indicated that is going to do a budget deficit of about 7.7%. But that was quite tricky in the sense that the, uh, the expenditure has been ballooned of out of uh, more than 90 billion, for which revenue has also been increased for more than 45 billion. Because earlier on, um, our budget, the 2022 budget, we read with uh, what we call it, um, a revenue of 100 billion, for which at the end of the day, um, we jump it to 145 billion for 2023. And so the gap, that 7.7% gap, is not necessarily just a small gap. It means government should find a way to raise huge sums of money. We're okay. talking about, you know, 45 billion. So effectively, um, in essence of last year's budget. Mm. So effectively, it tells you that, you know, um, we have dug our own hole mm. and we may have to find a means right. of coming up. Okay. And how to come out means that we may have to stay financially disciplined. And staying financially disciplined is quite difficult because this government, administra this administration, if you look at the kind of posture, you know, they've been adapting over the years, it's kind of aggressive, you know. And I'm not saying aggressive posture in economic management is not good. You become aggressive in economic management when you anticipate a huge production for which the production will be bring in proceeds that will offset the debt that you are incurring. Okay, okay. But we didn't see... We didn't. All right. Well, well, well noted with that. Now, Kofi, um, it also means that 
by the time we read the budget in November, in excess of 61 billion in, 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 in deficit. Um, and you look at what the individual bond uh, holders are saying. Uh, they're saying that they have even put forward a certain structure by which 54 billion by way of that reduction could have been achieved. It, it looks like government is holding on to a posture of still going on a spending spree, not committing itself to cutting expenditure, but expecting, but expecting the taxpayer to be absorbing <coughs> the largesse that in the continuous way by which it wants to undertake expenditure. Well, I disagree with that, Roland. Mm. I think government... You do, eh? I do, because there are evidence where government has taken discretionary cuts of 30% and other cuts. Time doesn't... will not permit me to go Oh, continue. It. We have the so, time. So uh, let me say. There, there is evidence, even in, when you look in the budget, that there's been certain reductions. Even in education, we've had some reductions, and elsewhere government has reduced expenditure. They are, they are good enough? No, I'm not... You are saying that the government is on a spending spree. And I'm saying that the government is rather cutting. Whether it's good or not, good enough or not, it's a different argument. I just wanted to rebut the fact that government is on a spending spree, which isn't the case. That's one thing. As far as the budget deficit, yes, it is true. We passed the Budget uh, Deficit Act, the Fiscal Deficit Act. Yes, in 2020... 18. No, in 2018, but in 2020, we, we went up to 15%. The Act allows you, in times of emergency, to go beyond the rate, which is the case, and we did. But if you look at last year, we began to show some discipline. The budget deficit uh, uh, threshold set was 7.7, .7, but government was able to do, I think, 6.6 .6 or something like that, showing that at least government is, is making some progress. Nevertheless... There's still more that government needs to do. But there's something that we all have to address our minds to. It's easy sitting here calling the interventions that government provided as freebies. It's easy sitting here. When the COVID came and people's lives were at stake, the government needed to do certain things. Now, let's not forget that the entire... I mean, the, the Auditor uh, General's great, report says... Control. The Auditor, uh, Auditor General's report... It's an opinion of the Auditor General. There are so many instances where the, what the Auditor General says is contrary to the fact. When you go to a public accounts committee, there are several instances where even before the report comes out, a lot of the fun, uh, challenges they, they raise have been resolved. Have been resolved. So when the, even recently, this report, there was an institution that came out that said that it disagrees with the Auditor General's position. For example, Ministry of Information, the Auditor General said they used some monies to pay risk allowance. The ministry provided reasons why they paid the risk allowance. Because remember, people's lives were at stake. They needed to go out there and, and help. But the Auditor General treated it as if they, it was some, some level of corruption. It wasn't. So let's be very mindful how we quote the Auditor General because there are several instances. So we shouldn't be quoting the Auditor General. I'm not saying we shouldn't be what quoting. What are you saying? I'm saying that we should quote the Auditor General in context. For example, the Auditor General came out last year and said that it's, it's been able to recover over $2 billion in some of the irregularities that it highlighted as if, and we treated it as if it was corruption. It wasn't. It wasn't. So this Auditor General report, when we are citing it, please, let's be mindful, because there are so many instances where it isn't the case that it's corruption. So let's put that aside. But the other thing that we are also not looking at is, aside from government expenditure to protect lives, government lost a lot of money, about 15 billion Ghana cities in revenue during COVID. How come we don't speak about this? When, when, when the issue of expenditure and revenue comes up. So it isn't as if government only got money and it, it spent the money recklessly and gave out freebies. No, it needed to pr protect lives. So it did everything necessary to protect lives. But as we were spending, we were also losing because tax revenues went down and all other forms of uh, uh, revenue went down because <clears throat> of the COVID. So let's look at that in a twofold. So, when you add it together, it was about 24 billion Ghana cities in revenue challenges that we had. Let's look at that objectively to be sure we cover the basis and not create the impression that government had 
money and he was just spending it on on, on free. It's strange. It's strange. It, yeah, but if it, you take uh, the reality of the situation is that it's only that year within the last couple of years that we uh, within COVID we recorded excessive surpluses because we're not importing a lot. And so government, on the other hand, also may not be getting revenue, but needed to keep its expendi expenditure is checked. And, th and that is what the Auditor General's report completely says. And, 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 and you see... It's not about anybody no, impugning and, what and is no, corruption or so not corruption. It, it's, I mean, there are obvious instances where you can yeah. see statutory infractions, clear issues that borders on corruption, misuse of public funds in the Auditor General's report. But you see... When Professor Lord Mensah um, was speaking, he made a very important point mm. that when you borrow in, in and of itself, it's not problematic. The issue is what the borrowing is used for. And I recall in 2016, this uh, famous quotation from Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. Again, I wish to just uh, um, paraphrase what he said. And this is what he said. That's on the... 10th day of um, June 2016. He said, if you go to borrow, you should use the bulk of that borrowing for investment and not consumption as it is happening now. You understand? So from Balmier's perspective, when you do the borrowing, use it for investment and not consumption. Now, if you recall, the previous NDC administration, for instance, when we went for the 3 billion Chinese facility, we used 1 billion of it to build a, a triable gas project. That's an investment that can repay. When we borrowed and we built Terminal 3, it has the capacity to repay. When we borrowed and started the project from, you know, doing our railway infrastructure from Tema to Impakadan, such thing can repay itself. But the bulk of the borrowing now is going into consumption. Look, the amount of money that has been voted for the office well, of the president. So hold on, I'm coming. The amount of money that has been voted for office of government machinery has been the largest since we started our democratic vis -vis experiment. What? Oh, please. Vis-a-vis -vis what? See, in 2022, when the budget statement was presented in November 17, 2021, right? Government provided its you know, budget from the office of the president alone by the deputy chief of staff. An amount of 148 million Ghana cities was put in there that this amount they have spent on operational enhancement costs. When government spends your money and put out there operational enhancement costs, what is the meaning of that? So the, the, the recklessness in using borrowed funds even for consumption is what has brought us here. And if you trace most of this, it goes back to the issues of corruption. And again, the president has not demonstrated any commitment towards the fight against corruption. I recall that either in Malawi, when there was a special audit on COVID-19, the president took special interest in that COVID-19 report, audit report, Miracle and fired Miracle. ministers well, who were found well, out let me, let to have misused... The Malawian president. Yeah, yeah. Malawian let president. Me, let me make a quick point. Look, let the Auditor General has sent his report, right? He, he, to, he, he says it's an opinion. To yeah, the Speaker it's, of it's, Parliament, even though, though, even, though it's, it's, even though Mr. 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 has a copy of this Auditor General's report. Uh, but it's surprising and that... Doing nothing Roland, it's surprising that all of a sudden... All of a sudden, the Auditor General that they said it's a poodle of a kufuado. They now believe in his auditing. No, if your poodle you, can you, produce you, this, you can said, you imagine what you said, all, all of a sudden, oh, you believe in the break. Auditor General. We'll all right of a sudden, you poodle. believe in the Auditor General. The general issue of individual bondholders and the solutions they've preferred and whether now government would need to cut its expenditure. Would they mean that, well, we need to go to Parliament by well, now or even before media and make some revisions, whether it's even possible. Now, the individual bondholders led by Senor Hussey, as well as the uh, allied groups or pressure groups, seem to have, um, well, had some level of negotiations with the finance ministry, reach an agreement. Now, Professor Lord Mensah 
Um, if you look at what the negotiations have been, their proposals um, to the other end or to government, they said government can cut its expenditure by at least some 54 billion. Um, how is that possible? And which of government items you look at the expenditure list on the budget need to be cut down or be looked at to be able to achieve that 54 billion or even close to it? Well, um, it's a call, and I think uh, government must hit to it, i.e., they're proposing that government should read a budget that the deficit will be around 7%, 7 billion to, sorry, 7% to 8%, you know, budget deficit. Okay. So, sorry, 7 billion to um, 8 billion budget deficit, mm. indirectly, because mm. the budget deficit is about 65 billion. Mm. So, if they're proposing um, 60, uh, 57, then we're looking at around uh, 7 to 8 billion budget deficit, Ghana cities. Now, I mean, clearly, uh, this sends a good signal. If government is able to do that, it should be able to, I mean, help the domestic bondholders and give them the signal that government is now adopting the conservative approach in managing the economy. Now, if you ask me the kind of items that the government may look at, mm. I will target the discretionary ones. So we're looking at uh, possibly the capital expenditure, which was increased from, I mean, last year's uh, expenditure of about, I mean, 10 billion, 11 billion to 25 billion this year. Um, I'm looking at the goods and services. There are some, you know, key uh, ministries that are attracting budgeting mm. in the goods and services, which I see them to be cost units in okay. the entire budget. Because if you relate the output of those ministries to the kind of expenditure that goes into decorating the minister, that goes into running that ministry, I can tell you that if we even collapsed that ministry, we would have been better okay. instead of keeping the ministry right. and draining the public press. Okay. The other thing we have, the, 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 in summary, the other thing we may have to look at is, you know, government doing that thing to ensure that it gives certain hope mm. into the, um, the, the investor community, All not right. the individual bonds alone. All these exercises we're going through, trust me, at the end of the day, we need the people of Ghana. We need the investor community to rebuild Ghana. Okay. So whatever we are doing now, we have to make sure that uh, it doesn't spill off, you know, mistrust in the financial space. Mm. Well, unfortunately, I just have four minutes. Four each, minutes. So, okay. okay. All right. So very so, quickly. So, okay. Very so, quickly. So my question is, yeah. where do we cut the? No, I, I agree with uh, goods and services, but I think uh -huh. we can do something there if government wants to. The capital expenditure bit, mm. uh, sometimes because government not, has key key programs there. Yeah, and and you know these are things that are meant to transform the country in terms of roads and other hospitals and all of that. So that one can can be a bit tricky because people are dependent on that. But goods and services, I can definitely see that we can do something there. I don't think we can do the entire 54 billion. I don't think so. But RDG talks about uh, borrowing. I mean, was I the person who said we've borrowed and chewed everything to the bone? I wasn't the person who said that. It was President Mahama who said that. So to sit here and create the impression as though you borrowed and none of it went to consumption, it's a lie. Because when we talk about consumption, we are talking about even paying teachers, paying all the other government workers and all of that. When you look at the budget expenditure, the wage bill, the wage bill and all of that, these are all part of consumption. Are you saying that under your government, you never took any money and used it for consumption? It can't be. Because President Mahama even admitted it, that he has chewed the money to the bone. Now, lastly, on the ballooning of the debt from 467 to 575 billion. It's a difference of about 108 billion. That 108 billion, when you read the report, attributes it to depreciation, 37% depreciation of the currency. So it's not like government. That went, is the city. That's the city. So it's not like government went on a, a spending spree or anything, and I mean, a borrowing spree and took new loans and all of that. No. It's essentially that sharp depreciation that we saw in October from 10 cities to 14.5 CDs. That is what accounted to the ballooning of the, the, the debt stock from 467 to 575. That's the reason for it. We hope 
that because the currency has improved, the city has improved, we hope that when Bank of Ghana, I mean, Ministry of Finance, because the Bank of Ghana figure is provisional, Ministry of Finance is going to provide the final numbers, hopefully next month, and we hope to see the value coming down because of the improvement in the city. We oh. hope to see that. Okay, yeah. four minutes to you. Yes. Sir. Uh, because he's raising a key issue about government is, hasn't been to the market the last quarter or two months, even though I know that just last week you know, uh, we went you know, in for... No, I'm speaking to a specific <laughs> figure. Between October. Is, is, I'm if, speaking October. to a specific if, if, figure. Yes, Let's yeah, stick yeah. to that. Yeah. If, and if, the within the period of September and October. <laughs> yes, and the, period, the report state is you not know, me saying it. So, it's so, not recall, me saying it. If you recall, yeah. on 1st July, Mr. Kufado announced that government of Ghana was going to join the IMA, you know, um, sign on to an IMA program. Okay. Subsequent to that, they've yes. sent over a billion Ghana uh, dollars worth of loans, yeah. different loans to parliament for approval. And I recall at that time, H. E. John Draman Mahama at the program at Gimpa said the NDC minority group should not cooperate. Yeah, but that unless, was captured on, in unless the we September know, unless, figure. Unless we know the specifics that those loans will be used for. That's beside it. The, there is also a raging issue whether government really intends to cut its expenditure. Mm. Look, as Based on the proposal of 54 exactly. billion. In the 2023 budget statement, mm. already Office of Government Machinery, they intend to employ additional 1,570 people. These are persons who, quote-unquote, may end up being presidential staffers. And if they are presidential staffers, they are going to pay the salaries of almost a deputy minister, a deputy minister. And so if you put all of these people together, at the time you, where you claim that you are ensuring a freeze in public sector recruitment, what is it at the Office of Government Machinery, that whole setup, that requires... 1,570 additional hands. One would expect Roland. that even if there's an opportunity for you to do this recruitment, mm -hmm. you'll be focusing on the productive, either health, education, or the security So you're saying government sector. is not committed to it? Because they already, have an agree they, already, they already have an agreement with the finance minister. How can you say that? Who, 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 who the has? individual bondholders. No, okay. ah, but this is a government. The finance minister has given you his word. No, listen. Ah, the president what are you said, talking oh, about? Listen. The, the whole president, budget, oh, would you listen? which portions are attributed to other areas? The what president are you himself, himself publicly told us Man. that there shall not be any haircuts. By December, when we're in the Christmas season, then we started seeing, you know, haircuts all over. So this is not a government that you can take their word for anything. Their word the, is not their bond. No. In yeah. fact, the bond or whatever agreement that they've signed on to, they do not intend. Because remember that first the president said, by, uh, no, finance minister said, oh, we'll get an IMF deal by February. Then the finance minister said, no, by March. We all do know that the IMF executive board do not meet in March. All right. They don't meet in February. So as we speak, so did you even, without, if, even without closing up on this domestic debt exchange program, you can't get an IMF program. Roland, even, we are in, even look, the time before we get an IMF program, the we, 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 we are looking at some of our practitioners uh, helping us do this the year to get Roland, an IMF Roland. program. Even, even, the, it, even, the, time, even the time it took now, let me read some of your messages the staff before I go. Was and then we're having this one what from the first one from the staff level agreement. The staff level agreement. Good morning, Roland. Ghanaians cannot understand why the MPP led by. President Anado, as uh, describing him as incompetent, President Anado, who promised not to rely on borrowing while in a position, are now doing worse in government. They have so far borrowed over 100 billion it's Ghana cities from the Bank of Ghana, it here that which has true. never happened in the history of this country. You have you, I've you proven it here that is not true. From Aaron Aaron, Tamale North. Good morning, Roland. Sure. President Anado and Ken have damaged our surviving economies stabled in the JM era and borrowed more than any other government since 1992. The reckless borrowing from uh, Bank of Ghana is the reason we're here today. And then we also have from Ejadu Gandhi Jumakum. This government keeps borrowing, yet is keeping it large sums of government, which is not yielding any result to the progress of the nation, but rather sinking. A totally failed and corrupt government. And at the MPP never again. And then Albert Kweku Brampa in uh, Butchie, 
or oh, Ashali Boche, a dental constituency. I agree with Professor Jongachi. Bank of Ghana can't help us out of these problems unless MPP sack uh, these Goro boys and area boys in government. We have nowhere to go. And that's uh, Mr. Brampa from the Adenta constituency. That's why we have to uh, wrap up. But we have uh, a discussion. Well, yesterday was your friend's birthday. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> so we, we, we have a, a big discussion. Uh, a discussion centered on young people not able to afford rent because household or landlords are taking rent in excess of over a year or two years. And then I also have to say, belated happy birthday, Edda Magbana. And I know that he was in Tajabu yesterday, organized a, a big uh, medical outreach and was highly patronized. And then also Ibrahim Mahama celebrated his birthday yesterday as well. And happy birthday to K Kofi Adoli. Okay. One of uh, our Okay, guys okay. All right. Okay. So um, all of you have a great time. Uh, join us. We'll have that discussion on rent because uh, it affects all of us, either ourselves, our relatives, or people we know. Stick and stay right here on TV3 New Day.